I'm glad to introduce to you Uriel Abulov, who received his PhD in international relations from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and was subsequently a Fulbright Scholar and a lecturer at NYU and Princeton University. Uh, today, he's an assistant professor at Tel Aviv University politi uh, Politics Department, as well as an associate at Princeton, uh, where he's going to be next year, too. Um, Princeton Woodrow Wilson School, and also at the Hebrew University Truman Institute. He studies political legitimation and violence, focusing on nationalism, revolutions, and ethnic conflicts. Uh, the Hebrew version of his book, um, The Mor Mortality and Morality of Nations, how is it called in mm -hmm. Hebrew? Exactly. Oh, in Hebrew, Al Pitehom. <laughs> yeah, uh, exact translation. Forthcoming in Haifa University Press, was awarded the 2012 Bahad Prize for the best non fiction book. Thanks. Um, yes, mortality and morality. So, in one way or another, Another. <laughs> this is what my big project is about, between these two trees. Mm. How can we focus on... How can I enlarge that? To have uh, yeah. There is a thingy. Um, which one do you want to enlarge? This bit? No, no. That's the which one do you want to make? No, no, no. That. That? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, you can just do... <laughs> that one? No, because I've got this on. You can turn that on. Ah, okay. then... Is that what you want to do? It's okay? And so I will be able to move how between? Uh, no? Aaron. No? no. Mm. Ah, no, 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 now we create it. Uh, <coughs> just Nick, can you try again? Oh, back, um, just uh, space. And then if I want to go back. Shift space. Oh, the arrows don't do it? Oh, backspace no. and then space. That's interesting. Oh, yeah. ah, cool. Okay. Learning new stuff every day. Okay. So, yes. These are my two trees. No, no, no. 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 Oh. Okay. <laughs> Morality and mortality, that's the essence of my work. And I do focus on nationalism, so uh, the book project that I've just completed is about the ways in which uh, nations are trying to develop their own sense of political legitimation and how that intertwines with their sense of uh, mortality that is, in a way, living on the edge, living on the edge of a certain existential abyss. Now. My main uh, object of uh, inquiry is trying to um, tap in to what people are holding as the normative reasoning of their actions in the political sphere. When the question why is posed not by us, the scientists, regarding certain social phenomenon, but when the social actors themselves are asking themselves why should I do the things that I would like to see uh, uh, as being done. And I think that this citation taken from Huckleberry Finn uh, captures the essence of it, the essence of the why, if we are speaking about morality and if we are looking into what might be termed a kind of internal conversation that we have with ourselves as we are trying to justify uh, what is around us. So here we have uh, Huck uh, thinking about whether or not to uh, reveal the fact that he is helping an escaped slave. And he's writing a letter telling on his friend uh, Jim, but later on contemplate 
the friendship that they've had and reaching the conclusion eventually that all right then I'll go to hell. Uh, although he is a, a, a Christian by uh, belief and uh, realized that what he has been doing is morally wrong, his moral personal conscience gets to predominate his decision eventually. So he would rather go to hell and help uh, his friend Jim than uh, basically succumbing to that uh, conventional wisdom that he was brought up on. Now, I guess that you won't be able to read the fine prints here, but the essence of that uh, flowchart is to try to um, delineate what I call um, public political thought. That is the way in which the public try to morally reason its political decisions. <laughs> and there are various ways in which we can uh, try to delineate that. The essence of it is locating those moral principles to which we subscribe as uh, individuals and as societies and the ways in which those moral principles actually inform our decision in the political sphere. I actually have no idea what you're seeing behind me because here it's completely static. Uh, okay, no, I don't think that we'll have time for, for this uh, too complicated chart. It's basically trying to locate how I see morality in the uh, greater metrics of politics. This is the essence of my methodological paper. And the question is, basically, how can we tap into those internal moral conversations that we hold with ourselves about the justification of what's going on in politics? And I think that uh, one portal to do that, the kind of uh, uh, tapping points, tapping points to tap into uh, uh, that language of legitimation is through normative concept analysis. What are normative concepts? Those are certain uh, keywords that we use in order to bring about certain notions of right and wrong, certain things that we believe to be um, just justificatory. That is, they provide legitimation or they delegitimize certain things that we have in our political life. And my basic argument in that regard is that we can see three main dimensions in trying to decipher the language of legitimation through normative concept analysis. One is here in the triangle, the sort, what types of legitimation are we employing? And various scholars obviously employ various types of legitimation. Many of us draw on uh, Max uh, Weber uh, classical uh, typology of legitimation, but there are other options. Uh, scope, the salience and resonance of the various legitimating efforts that we are uh, uh, intertwined with in the public political sphere and the scale, the extent and intensity of our legitimating efforts. What is it that we are trying to legitimate? And to what extent uh, is it a, um, a contested effort or does it go uncontested? Uh, in the article, I also uh, um, outlined several research strategies, but I here would mainly focus on the way that I actually carried out the specific method. And for me, it's almost always a kind of a mixed method approach which integrate both the qualitative, uh, that I call discourse tracing, and the quantitative, that is uh, the more familiar corpus linguistics. The uh, combination <coughs> between the two is sometimes referred to in the literature as more than the acronic corpus assisted discourse studies. We'll see how this actually uh, come about in the uh, two case studies that I will now discuss. The first case studies, we, uh, which is a uh, uh, project pretty much uh, completed is about self-determination. I'm fascinated by that concept, self-determination. We've had it to run for actually more than a century, but for the last century in particular, self-determination was universalized as a political legitimating principle in global politics. Obviously by Woodrow Wilson, US president uh, uh, at the end of World War I, what we see above is the way that Woodrow Wilson would like us to see the principle of uh, self-determination. What uh, we see at the bottom is the way that his own uh, Secretary of State, Robert Lansing, was framing self-determination basically as a dangerous uh, principle that can bring about a lot of trouble. So my first uh, effort in that regard was uh, trying to charge uh, the frequency, the saliency of actually turning into that concept of self-determination. And I used uh, a very simple method of uh, word frequency going to the New York Times. Can you actually see that or am I in the way of the, the chart? 
Uh, this is a chart from uh, New York Times. I've traced the usage of uh, uh, the concept itself, self-determination, throughout uh, more than the last uh, century. So you can see here the ups and downs. And uh, one of the first things that uh, struck me behind the, uh, uh, the uh, first period is that since basically the mid-60s, uh, we have an ongoing decline in the uh, discourse on self-determination itself. There are, of course, fluctuations here, but the trend is very clear. And certainly in the last uh, uh, 12, 13 years, uh, the concept itself, self-determination, has reached uh, any, at least in that regard, in the New York Times. I try to uh, verify uh, those findings in various ways. So here we see uh, the correlation between the New York Times and the Washington Post, very high correlation between the two studies. Uh, obviously, that was not enough, because here we only uh, have the uh, absolute uh, numbers of the uh, word frequency. So I turn into the uh, uh, various corpora that we have at uh, uh, BYU. Uh, some of the important ones for my study was the Corpus of Contemporary uh, American English, the Corpus of Historical American English, and the Time Magazine Corpus. So that was the result integrating the various findings from uh, what you've seen before. And we do, I think, uh, see it as verifiable. That is the rise of self-determination as a concept until the uh, 60s. And from then on, from the 60s onward, uh, a decline in actually turning into the concept of self-determination until it actually reached that uh, in the last decade. Now, the question, obviously, that I'm uh, most interested in is why. And indeed, I should say that in all my studies in which I actually mix those methods, the quantitative and the qualitative, I usually see the uh, quantitative findings as mainly bringing up interesting findings and uh, perhaps giving certain hints at answers that are mostly uh, driven by qualitative, more qualitative uh, analysis. So what could be the uh, reasons? What could be the causes for that decline in the discourse on self-determination? Which is, we should say, this is not the political science workshop, but self-determination is by and large regarded as one of the two key principles of global politics. We have self-determination on the one hand and territorial integrity on the other. So what explained that uh, a very substantial demise in the discourse on self-determination in uh, the last uh, uh, 40, 50 years, and, and, and most prominently so in the last decade? Now, one explanation could be that self-determination simply became a kind of a given. It goes without saying that we subscribe to self-determination. So why should we actually mention that phrase? It is an obvious thing. Now, quantitatively speaking, I think it's very hard to either verify or falsify that kind of hypothesis. We can possibly argue that if it is indeed a given, we shouldn't see so much fluctuation as you saw in the previous uh, slides. But still, we do have a very uh, uh, clear decline. For me, in order to verify or falsify that assertion, we have to go to a qualitative uh, study. That is, to what extent people actually turning today, there are still people using today the, the, the concept of self-determination. To what extent for them using that concept is a kind of an obvious thing that they actually could have uh, do without, or, do it actually, or does it actually mean something more substantial? And is it a contestable, a still contestable principle? So qualitatively speaking, what we've seen before with the quotes of Woodrow Wilson and his uh, 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 Secretary of State actually still goes on today. There is a lot of ongoing debates about what self-determination wins in various levels. And we'll get into that later on. So I think that the first hypothesis, self-determination becoming a kind of a given, is problematic. Perhaps it gives a very, very partial explanation, but it is a very limited one. Another possible explanation is that it is simply a question of fashion, linguistic fashion. Once we use self-determination, today we can use various other concepts that pretty much capture the same space. It could be about recognition. It could be about self-government. It could be about autonomy. It could be about self-rule. There are various, various concepts that actually can, can, in theory at least, take the same space that self-determination uh, had before. So we, I think, that uh, quantitative beyond the uh, qualitative elements could perhaps reveal some of the uh, answer, if this is indeed true or not. So these are some of the concepts, not all the concepts that I've studied, but some of the concepts that I've studied basically trying to see perhaps when self-determination has uh, declined, then those concepts have uh, risen uh, concomitantly. And these are, of course, all in relative terms, not uh, in absolute uh, numbers. 
And I think that it would be very hard to uh, try and corroborate the uh, uh, linguistic fashion hypothesis considering those findings. Because indeed, those other concepts have also declined. So why? Why have, haven't those concepts actually taken the space that self-determination used to hold? And I think that one key reason is that self-determination is distinct. It's distinct in terms of what it actually means as a legitimating principle in world politics. And part of the way that we can try to uh, trace that is through collocates. That is the words that are approximate to self-determination as compared to other concepts that are used in world politics, such as uh, what I provide here, uh, uh, autonomy or self-government, and we can go on and on. And if you can see, I don't know if you can actually read the small fonts here, but there are very clear distinction between the collocates that are used with self-determination and those that are used with the alternative concept. Self-determination highlights collocates such as right, national, principle, freedom, people, free nations, etc. Whereas for autonomy, for example, it's local, complete, more, degree, greater, sum, relative, regional, etc. What I think makes self-determination so unique is that it is perceived as a kind of a basic belief in the study of political science and, and the others in, in social sciences. Basically, basic beliefs are about those principles that we hold as almost so sacred that they give justification. They legitimate other beliefs that we may have. But in and by themselves require later affirmation. And so self-determination has that capacity. There is still contestation. We'll get into that about what it means. But subscribing to self-determination, holding that it is indeed an important principle that we should all hold on to, this is almost a kind of a common uh, understanding in, among uh, uh, politicians. Considering the fact that the three main ideologies of the 20th century, that is liberalism, communism, and fascism, in various ways, subscribe to self-determination. Actually, self-determination emerged in communist discourse, socialist discourse. And Hitler was one of the main prominent uh, proponents of self-determination throughout the 30s, because that was his normative rationale of why Germany should extend its border to incorporate all those Germans that did not live at first within the borders of the Third Reich. So self-determination, obviously, in the liberal cup. So self-determination as a principle was regarded as almost a sacred one. Um, this is, again, uh, uh, collocates uh, uh, using the uh, mutual information scores. And here we see self-determination, uh, the list of uh, the various words. And the same with autonomy, the only word that is shared by both. And this goes on to, to other concepts, is Palestinian. And still today, although we do have as I, saw, as I showed before, a great decline in the discourse on self-determination, the one point that keeps self-determination still in the discourse substantially, there are the cases, of course, but more minor, is the Palestinian self-determination issue. This is still very much uh, shared in the political discourse uh, on pertaining issues. So this is the second explanation, the linguistic fashion. And as I try to show, I think that uh, that kind of method help us understand that perhaps linguistic fashion is not the key explanation. Perhaps it is a minor, again, part of that, but it is not the key explanation. More substantial explanations, I think, is the third explanation, which uh, in a way I title mission accomplished. What does it mean? It means that basically the mission of self-determination was to create more and more nation states. We should use that concept in order to provide with, uh, to more peoples that tried to actually establish their own political independence. So what you see here is the correlation between the discourse on self-determination and the number of new states formed in the international system. And the correlation is high. It's about uh, 0 0.65, if I'm not mistaken. So the correlation is high. Although, although, and this is important, I think, qualification to that explanation, we should bear in mind that what self-determination was mainly about is providing those ethnic peoples with the right to form their nation state. Most of the states created in the international system throughout the last century, beyond the European borders, were no such states. Consider the case of Yugoslavia, consider the case of the uh, uh, Soviet uh, Union collapsing into its various ingredients. In all of those cases, the new states forms, and obviously this is the big rise in the 1990s. In all of those cases, the state form were not 
in actual practice were not driven by that sense of ethno-national self-determination. It was basically taking the already established borders that were provincial in both the Yugoslavia and the USSR and simply granting them a status of an independent statehood in all of those cases. Well, not all, but in the great majority of those cases, we have substantial national minorities. It is not like in the era after the Cold War, we have conducted a referendum throughout the region and trying to establish new borders that would correspond to the ethno-national creed. So it is an important explanation, but uh, um, in a qualified way. And finally, I think that we can speak uh, on an explanation that I think is perhaps the most appealing, but again, it's kind of a proportion issue, which I term as taming self-determination, which basically means trying to take this explosive concept, which is, as both, in a way, Wilson and Lansing agreed on. It is a perilous concept, and it is an explosive one. The question is whether for the good or the bad. But in essence, what many politicians, and as we'll uh, uh, see in a moment, many academics, have been trying to do is tame that principle. How it was tamed? Um, by simply switching it from the self-determination by people to other determination by states, in trying to focus on the question of finding and defining the people, basically depriving ethnic communities of the right to have uh, independent statehood, and third, the third uh, strategy, by defending states while denying statehood. Trying to say, okay, you can have self-determination, but self-determination doesn't mean independence. You can have self-determination, even if it's only a self-governance within an already established state. And I think that an important uh, actor, an important agent in bringing about that change was the academic milieu, what we uh, often refer to in political science, the epistemic community. And one way to show that the, that academic epistemic community was so prominent in bringing about the change is indeed seeing the way that throughout the last century, the usage of the concept of self-determination has changed. And it has changed substantially in terms of gender. The gender in which self-determination is actually used. And today it is much more used within the academic milieu. And here is the concept self-determination is, is rarely used within in? in context of nation state or just as a in, national self-determination. Self when we speak about the self-determination of peoples, it is still used occasionally in newspaper, in magazines, etc. Yeah. But by and large, in terms of proportion, more and Maybe more political. by the academic. Excuse me? Maybe in political science. I'm focusing on self-determination as it is used in political science. Certainly. Uh, we can speak later on in the Q&A about self-determination as used in other fields. And there are, of course, practices in other fields. Yeah. So just uh, two minutes about uh, my second project, which is only just, uh, well, not just beginning. I, I've been uh, in it for the last year or so. It is the Arab Spring. And what I find fascinating about the Arab Spring, the main concept that brought uh, me to be interested in that, is the slogan of the Arab Spring. El Shab Yurid is Katanizam. El Shab Yurid is the people want, or the people actually want, because we're here referring to the people as a collective, not a collection of individuals. And it resonates very strongly in the chronicles of the Arab Spring throughout the last uh, 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 three years. I think most, most remarkably, you can see it in that speech by Muhammad Morsi, the elected president of Egypt, uh, a representative, clear representative of the Ikhwan, of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, who should subscribe to divine legitimation. But here, standing in Tahrir Square, actually understand the great changes that has taken place, and again and again referring to the people uh, uh, that stands before him as the source of legitimacy. And there was an ongoing debate in the various social network uh, 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 website of the Ikhwan of did actually uh, Muhammad Mursi uh, meant uh, what he said in that speech or not, what is indeed the source of legitimation? And uh, this is just uh, my theoretical understanding of it. This is the various metrics of uh, political legitimation. Uh, this is how the changes uh, transpire between positive and negative uh, political legitimation, weak and strong agency. Um, and this is the change that I think took place uh, in the Arab Spring, the decline of the Hobbesian social contract in which you basically have a kind of a strong Leviathan, a benevolent Leviathan that you should uh, 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 provide with almost absolute authority over you. And while that social contract has declined, the Rousseauian social contract, I think, has substantially risen. How do I try to trace that? Um, I've compiled using 
insights from uh, qualitative discourse analysis, various concepts that are often used in the, our public discourse in the last generation, trying to chart their position along the matrix that resonates with the chart the, that I showed before, the theoretical chart. And the main task is to try and trace both quantitatively and qualitatively the ways in which those various normative concepts, and here of course I go beyond what I showed before in the case of only one normative concept, self-determination, you were trying to understand uh, normative concept analysis in the framework of a whole society or various societies and the way that the sh there was shifts in the uh, saliency and input on uh, various um, concepts. We are using the BBC monitoring for translated primary sources, but also using uh, Egyptian uh, newspaper. And Masri Liaum is uh, very prominent because he's one of the uh, least official newspapers that were already there before the revolution started. And also uh, Facebook uh, 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 pages uh, such as uh, We Are All uh, Khaled Said, which is very prominent, perhaps the leading Facebook uh, page that uh, uh, stands behind the digital, the digital uh, uh, rise of the revolution in Egypt and, and beyond Egypt. Uh, these are just uh, some of the elements uh, that we have uh, managed, the, the text here is obviously in Hebrew, of the uh, <coughs> various changes in the emphasis of the values within that Facebook page. Uh, I should perhaps conclude in saying that, of course, it is not only about words. There are also visual images that often enough intertwine with normative concepts. For example, Obama can uh, uh, help himself in uh, uh, removing his uh, shoe, but uh, Egyptian uh, businessmen should have someone do it for them. Or very remarkably, the way in which the Egyptian newspaper changed the photograph that was actually uh, being taken in the White House to put Mubarak not behind but in front of uh, uh, the people. And it was discovered in the social media and put in, uh, in front to show how basically the regime, the Egyptian regime, is trying to uh, give us a sense that is utterly falsifiable. And the media helped to falsify the lies of the regime and I think to a large extent also aid the revolution itself. That's it. Thank you.